morning and welcome to our Veterans Day Assembly. The theme of our celebration today is sacrifice. We can't let this moment pass without thanking all of our essential workers who have gotten us through the worst of times in 2020. Many have been fighting against an enemy that is both visible and invisible, from the pandemic to fighting fires and keeping food on our tables. So much of our country has suffered and those who have seen and lived the suffering firsthand have made horrendous sacrifices. To all of our essential workers, thank you for holding the hands of those dying alone, looking for a cure, fighting fires to save lives and homes, to those helping victims of violent storms, to keeping food on our tables, our sincere debt of gratitude. We may be divided in many ways, but in many ways we are united. Our heroes have stepped up to answer the call of duty to a grieving nation. May God bless each and every one of you and give you the strength to carry on when exhaustion prevails. You are loved and appreciated. Thank you. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Rich Wyckoff and Heritage Park for putting this video together. We need to keep the tradition going, however that form may be. We need to teach our children respect, and we need to respect those heroes who step outside their own minds and bodies and keep our country safe and free. So Rich Wyckoff and Heritage Park, I thank you for putting this beautiful video together. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you and have a wonderful day. <laughs> the United States Army. Over hill, over dale, we will hit the dusty trail and the caissons go rolling along. In and out, do them shout, counter march, ride aloud, and the caissons go rolling along.
Commandant of the 856 Marine Corps League Detachment in Clinton County. I would like to thank your principal, Mike Hall, the faculty, the staff, and security at Bucktail Area High School. Special thanks to Patricia Wilson for organizing the Veterans Day Assembly. I also want to thank Tom Bisman, commander of the American Legion, also the commander of the American Legion, Bernie Yusuf, the past commander, commander of VFW, George Krause, and all the members who participated in the honoring veterans and people in our community this year of 2020. Thank you for your service. And now some education on how this day came to be called Veterans Day. This day which began as Armistice Day was originally set as a U.S. legal holiday to honor the end of World War I, which officially took place on November 11, 1918. In legislation that was passed in 1938, November 11 was dedicated to the cause of world peace and to be thereafter celebrated and known as Armistice Day. This new legal holiday honored World War I veterans. In 1954, after having been through World War II and the Korean War, the 83rd U.S. Congress, at the urging of veteran service organizations, amended the Act of 1938 by striking out the word armistice and inserting the word veterans. With approval of this legislation, November 11th became a day to honor American veterans of all wars. Veterans Day serves as a very important purpose. It is a day we recognize not just those who have given their lives in war, but also those who have worn the uniforms of service. This day, above all, is an opportunity to celebrate the choice one makes to serve their country. For some, it meant the World War conflict of World War II, or a lifetime of peacekeeping missions, or tense standoff of the Cold War. Others, in the jungles of Vietnam, or in Korea, Panama, and other conflicts, which we asked our military to serve over the years. And of course, we can't forget that today, for many service, multiple tours to Iraq and Afghanistan on active duty or as reservists and guard members who sacrificed twice when they gave up their civilian jobs in order to serve our country. We have many, many examples of courage, service, and sacrifice to reflect on today. Let's use this opportunity now and on Veterans Day and the years to come to celebrate service to our nation, to demonstrate the appreciation we have of our military and to inspire future generations to dedicate themselves in the name of the many who have come before them. Thomas Jefferson once said, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Today, we give thanks to live in a country where citizens from every generation willingly and courageously raise their hands to stand the watch. For all those veterans here today, thank you for your service and your sacrifice. I share the pride you feel in being able to count yourselves among the 1%, the greatest military in the world. For all those not in the military, thank you for choosing to share this special day with us and show your support to our heroes, past and present. And a reminder about our flag. Our flag does not fly because the wind moves it. It flies with the last breath of each soldier who died protecting it. Thank you.
if I had to choose one word uh, to describe my grandfather um, in as little as 30 seconds, uh, that word would be service. Um, not only because he served in the military, uh, but also that ever since I was really little, um, I always remember him looking for the next way to help somebody, whether it was through the community like the church or some other means. He was always looking for the next opportunity to, ha to help somebody out and benefit someone else. And I feel like that's just the best way I can describe him as a person. One word to describe my grandpa would be caring. Living three hours away every summer, I would come up and visit, and during that time, I would see how much he would help others and give back to the community. He was a kind-hearted man, and if you were someone to know him, then you could see that he cared for others deeply. 30 seconds is clearly not enough time to talk about the kind of man my grandfather was, but to keep things short and simple, my grandfather was a man full of encouragement and encouraging words. Um, I am not ashamed to say that I failed most of my classes my first two years of college and struggled a lot, and my grandfather knew that. Um, he continuously told me how proud he was of me, and not only myself, but Ben, Kayla, my brother, and the rest of my family. He taught me that it was okay to fail, um, but to never give up on myself. And my grandfather, even though he thought through three years of a devastating illness, he continuously told me that it was okay to make mistakes, but to learn from them, to own them, and to grow from them. And he is the reason why I am doing so well right now and accomplishing all of my goals. And I will forever be grateful for that and carry it with me through my future endeavors. If I had to describe my grandfather using one word, I would describe him as being devoted. For the 15 years he was with me, he always put full effort into anything he was doing. He was devoted to my brother, my cousins, and I, and he always put his family first before himself. Even in his worst days in the hospital, he would always ask how we were doing and how our lives were, regardless of the situation. I couldn't have asked for a better role model growing up. The POW-MIA place setting is an empty chair at all official meetings of the American Legion. The table is set for one. It is also given a place of honor at official dinners, which begin with a prayer. The table is small, symbolizing the frailty of one prisoner alone against his or her suppressors. The tablecloth is white, symbolic of their intentions to respond to the country's call to arms. The single red rose in the vase signifies the blood they may have shed in sacrifice to ensure the freedom of our beloved United States. The rose also reminds us of the family and friends of our missing comrades who keep the faith while awaiting their return. The ribbon on the vase represents the determination of proper accounting of our comrades who are not among us tonight. A slice of lemon on the plate reminds us of their bitter fate. The salt on the plate reminds us of the countless fallen tears of families as they wait. The glass is inverted. They cannot toast with us. The chair is empty. They are not here. The candle is reminiscent of the light of hope which lives in our hearts to illuminate their way home away from their captors to the open arms of a grateful nation. Let us pray to the Supreme Commander that all of our comrades will soon be back within our ranks. And let us remember and never forget their sacrifices. May God forever watch over them and protect their families. Hello, my name is Angela Antelora, and I'm going to be reading Rags Hear a Dog of World War I, written by Margot Thiaz Raven and illustrated by Petra Brown. Rags was just a stray mutt until the day he met Private James Donovan, where he not only found a home, but a friend. This book tells the incredible true story of their friendship and of their adventure together in the First World War. The First World War began on July 28, 1914, and ended on November 11, 1918. Battles took place in more than eight different areas of the world and on three continents. 
Of all the major fighting armies, only the United States did not formally make dar dogs a part of its World War I military ranks. But Germany, with 30,000 dogs, France and England with 20,000 dogs each, and other countries trained canine corps to be sentry, messenger, and ambulance dogs. There was another kind of historic canine soldier called the mascot dog. These unlikely soldier dogs were strays who usually attached themselves to a person or a combat unit and ended up going to war besides the human they adopted. Although not initially militarily trained, these dogs were gratefully utilized by the U.S. forces in World War I. They bravely risked their lives and lifted up the spirits of the battle-weary troops. Their story is an old one. It began when a dog first befriended man, and man was better for it. Many, many years ago, during World War I, there lived a real dog who began life in an alleyway of a Paris cafe. The dog was a shaggy mutt, a small scrappy gutter pup, who belonged to no one but the streets where he roamed. He didn't even have a name except for the angry ones cafe owners yelled to chase him away from their garbage. The stray lived by the wits alone for he hadn't a friend in the world since the day he was born. Then one July evening, sirens blared. They warned the people of Paris to shutter their windows and black out lamps so they wouldn't be seen by enemy planes. Danger filled the streets, so the dog took shelter in an empty doorway just as the night turned as dark as a pocket. The mutt didn't know his life was about to change when an American soldier stumbled into the inky blackness and yipe, stepped on his paw. The soldier lit a match and saw a scraggly face with two worried eyes staring at him. Did I hurt you, pal? Asked Private James Donovan. He had come with the U.S. Army's fighting first division to help France end the war. Donovan picked the mutt up. The dog had never been held before and liked what he was feeling until a stern military policeman appeared. Your pass? The policeman de demanded of Donovan. Sure hope you're a good luck pup, Donovan whispered to the dog, because he didn't have a pass that allowed him to be out in the city at night. He had just marched in a big Paris parade that day with an American battle on. Instead of returning to base, Donovan stayed in Paris to sightsee. Now he was in trouble. Sir, this dog is our division mascot. I ran off base to find him when he went missing. Our unit pulls out tomorrow and our commander wouldn't be happy to leave this little guy behind. Donovan quickly made up a tail taller than the Eiffel Tower. Dogs? He looks like dirty rags to me, scowled the military policeman. Yes, sir, Donovan agreed. That's exactly how he got his name. First division rags, quite the pup he is. The policeman nodded, the name sure fit. He decided to let them go. Back at the army base, Rags sat still and straight by Donovan's side in front of the commander. A surprise Private Donovan learned that instead of being in trouble, he'd gotten a new rank and assignment that very day. Pack up, Sergeant. Tonight you move out for the battlefield, the commander told him. Rags too, sir, hoped Donovan. Rags too, the commander agreed. He seems like a smart fellow. Rags and Donovan rumbled out of Paris in a motor truck. Good old Rags, Donovan said, scratching the dog's head. We're in this war together now. Rags curled up by his side. Rags stayed close to the soldier, even when Donovan tried to keep him from the battlefront. Rags jumped out the window at the division headquarters and followed him in secret. Back at camp, Donovan felt a wet nose nudge him. It was Rags. From that day on, he was Donovan's dog through thick and thin. Rags liked the infantry work, especially sharing Donovan's food rations and drinking water from his helmet. Rags found many important jobs to do. He chased mice and rats out of the field trenches where the soldiers slept and ate. His ears heard the buzz of incoming shells before the soldiers did. When Rags fell belly to dirt, so did the soldiers. Rags loved rolling in the dirt. It made his shaggy eyebrows look like fuzzy caterpillars to Donovan. 
Rags even learned to salute. He'd raise his paw to his face, then drop it as a smart show of respect. Once a general walked by, Rags stopped, squatted, and raised his paw. The general respectfully returned his paw. Donovan was a signal man. He laid telephone wires on the ground so soldiers at the battlefront could communicate with soldiers in the rear, the ones with the bigger guns. Rags nose read Donovan wires like a book, and he helped him find breaks in the lines. Rags worked as a runner, too. Donovan would put a piece of paper under Rags' collar, turn him to face the rear, and say, Go find! Rags then ran toward the sound of the big guns and waited there until someone came to take his message. It was his most dangerous job. Donovan made Rags a little gas mask to protect him from the enemy's poisonous gas. Rags hated it. It blocked his nose. He couldn't smell. He pushed it off with his paws, but Donovan would put it right back on. We don't want you going west on us, pal, he'd say in a way that the soldiers spoke of dying. Rags didn't understand Donovan, but his voice calmed him like a nap in the sun, so he'd keep his mask on. By late September of 1918, news about the hero mascot had spread through the 1st Division. Soldiers told how Rags had bitten an enemy's leg to defend Donovan, how he'd crawl under barbed wire fences to run messages, and how he never gave up, not for a minute, no matter how much the sky exploded. He became a legend of courage, a giant of a dog. Then one day, October 9th, 1918, a major battle began in the Argonne Forest. Fog was so thick Donovan couldn't see his lines. The air was choked with poison. Men were trapped. Donovan tightened their gas mask and tied a message on rags. It told the rear soldiers where to fire to help the men. Donovan's mouth was tight with worry as he gave rags the command, go find. Rags began to run back when a big blast hit nearby. It sprayed metal like hard rain over rags. It cut his paw, his ear, his eye. It threw Donovan to the ground, tore off his mask. Rags' mask was gone, too. He licked Donovan's face. Donovan struggled to his feet. They moved together. Donovan and Rags limping, staggering toward the rear. Another shell hit. It flipped Rags to the ground. A soldier found him and the message he carried. Wounded, Donovan was taken to the field hospital. Rags, he gasped as he woke up to find the dog beside him. Then loudly, the big guns began to fire. Crash, boom, blasted the shells from the rear to the rescue, the trapped men. Rags turned his face up to Donovan at the good sound. He knew. You did it, pal. Donovan's smile broke wide over Rags. You saved him. In the field hospital, a doctor found Rags under Donovan's blanket. He took a shell splinter from Rags' eye, sewed up his ear and his foot. One ear was deaf, one eye blind. He'd limp. But Rags was alive and with his Donovan. Donovan's friends hid Rag under his coat to board the dog on the hospital ship, taking Donovan to America. Base hospital staff in Chicago cared for Donovan. Rags had healed. He lived in a firehouse on base. Rags made a bed for himself under the hose cart, but spent each day with Donovan. He'd sit outside the main hospital door in the morning and wait for someone to let him in. Then he'd lay on Donovan's bed, being a good medicine, until he had to leave at dusk.
One day in the hospital, Donovan wrapped his arms around Rags. Good old Rags, he nuzzled against his neck. Rags sensed Donovan put a go find message under his collar with a hug, but no paper was there. Donovan grew weak from coughing that day, so Rags licked his hand. The following morning, Rags was frantic when he couldn't find Donovan. He searched the ward bed by bed. Exhausted with worry, he went to the front door. Paced, a medical officer knew Donovan was in critical care, a place for very ill soldiers. I'll get you to him tomorrow, I promise, he told Rags. Rags left the hospital, no tail wagged and Donovan died in the night. The next day, the medical officer took Rags to Donovan's empty bed. The pup needs to learn in his own way. He'd convinced the hospital staff. Rags laid down where Donovan wasn't anymore. His nose read the story of Donovan's last day. Donovan's legs were tired, he was cold. He had gone west for a nap in the sun. Rags stayed on the bed for a long time that day. Then he climbed off. He walked the hallway to the front door for the last time and waited for the medical officer to end it. He wagged his thanks, then Rags walked slowly to the firehouse. It is told that Rags never went near the hospital again. He knew Donovan wasn't there. His best friend now lived in his heart. Epilogue, Donovan's message. Rags was sad in the spot that wagged his tail. He missed Donovan, and so he grieved, but Rags wasn't alone. The first division mascot had a family now, a military family, and a forever home with the U.S. Army. Then one day, Major Raymond W. Hardenberg moved on base with his wife and two daughters, Helen and Sue. Rags just knew in the spot that wags his tail that he had a message for them from Donovan. Not a paper one, but a go find one just the same. It came with Donovan's last hug. It said, please love my dog. Rags wanted the girls to find it, but they grew wary of his friendly barks. So Rags stopped. He remembered when carrying a go find note he had to wait until someone found him. Helen and Sue knew Rags was a hero. Rags showed them he was a good dog too. The girls took Rags into their house one day. Sue in the Hardenberg home became his. And when Major Hardenberg was assigned to a new base, the family learned Rags could not go with them. As an army member, Rags was an official ward of the base. Helen and Sue pleaded with army officials. The officials ruled that the Hardenbergs could have trusteeship of Rags for his best good. Still, the girls were told if Rags wished to stay where he had last lived with Donovan, it was his choice. The family packed up and piled in the car, but the girls left the car door open and waited. Rags wanted to go and wanted to stay. Then he remembered a doorway in Paris that had changed his life forever. Donovan would want him to jump through this one. He did. Rags leapt into the car between the two girls and rode into his many happy years ahead. The tail end. On March 21st, 1936, Lieutenant Colonel Hardenberg released a statement that Rags had died at 20 years of age. The news ran in the New York Times. Rags' obituary told he was some kind of pup. He was part mutt, part Karen Terrier. The hero dog served in three major World War I campaigns and saved many lives. For his bravery, he received two Chevron awards, two wound chevrons, a U.S. Army decoration, and he was inducted into the Legion of Hero Dogs. The Long Island Kennel Club also created a dog show category with ribbon award for his outstanding wartime achievements. Newspaper, magazine, and a biography placed in the Imperial War Museum in London covered Rags' lifetime achievements, such as when he led the World War I 10th Anniversary Parade down Broadway in New York City. He was photographed with the attending legendary World War I generals. Rags lived with the Hardenberg family on several military bases. At Fort Benning, 
Georgia, Rags was badly injured when hit by a car when crossing the street. His blind eye and deaf ear made street crossing very difficult. With typical plucks, Rags battled back to wander again. He lived his last year in Washington, D.C., where John J. Pershing, the Supreme Commander of the U.S. Army Forces in France, gave 1st Division Rags a ride one day. Rags is buried at Aspen Hill Park in Silver Spring, Maryland. His tomb reads, Rags, War Hero, 1st Division Mascot, World War I, 1916 to 1936. But to Donovan, Rags was the loyal little dog who made the great war human. That's the end. Sacrifice is when something is given up or lost. Veterans make sacrifices to our country. S. So many people sacrifice their lives so others can vote. A. Armistice Day was the first official day for Veterans Day. C. Courageous men and women fought for this country. Our remembrance of all veterans takes place on November 11th. I. In 1954, on November 11th, Veterans Day was created. F. Families have to sacrifice many things when military parents go off to war. Uh, in an act of someone or something else, we are happy to help our friends out. See, there currently, there can't, yeah, currently there are over 21 million veterans in the U.S. E. Every veteran dedicates their life. Thank you, veterans. This is Colossa. I go to Bucktail High School. I live in Renova, Pennsylvania. I joined the Army because I always wanted to be an infantryman and I wanted to follow my family's footsteps by uh, joining the military.
Daddy, I'm afraid Won't you stay a little while Keep me safe Cause there's monsters right outside Daddy, please don't go I don't want to be alone Cause the second that you're gone They're gonna know Before he went to bed He grabbed my hand and said Just cause I'm leaving It don't mean it I just can't call you up when things get rough Before I left, he hugged my neck and said Just cause you're leaving, it don't mean it I won't be right by your side When you need me, you can't see me
We would like to do the folding of the American flag. Sean Tortella would present the flag to Jay Morocco and Art Kramer for the folding. There will be 13 folds in the flag. And each fold represents a certain thing about the flag. First fold is a symbol of life. The second fold is for our belief in eternal life. The third fold is made in honor and remembrance of the veteran's departing rank who gave a portion of his or her life for the defense of our country to attain peace throughout the world. The fourth fold stands for our weaker nature as American citizens trusting in God. It's to him we turn to in times of peace as well as war for his divine guidance. The fifth fold is a tribute to America. In the words of Stephen Decor, our country, in dealing with other countries, may she always be right, but it is still our country, right or wrong. The sixth fold is where our heart lies. It's with our flag that we pledge allegiance to the flag and the republic to which it stands. The seventh fold is a tribute to our armed forces. For it is armed forces that protect our country and flag against enemies, whether they be domestic or foreign. The seventh fold, excuse me, the eighth fold is a tribute to the one who entered into the valley of the shadow of death, that we might see the light of day and to honor our mother, whom it flies on Mother's Day. The ninth fold is a tribute to womanhood, for it is through their faith, love, loyalty, and devotion that the character of the men and women who have made this country great have been molded. The tenth fold is a tribute to Father, for he has given his sons and daughters for the defense of our country, since he or she was first born. The 11th fold, in the eyes of the Hebrew citizens, represents the lower portion of the seal of King David and King Solomon, and glorifies, in their eyes, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The 12th fold, in the eyes of a Christian citizen, represents an emblem of eternity and glorifies in their eyes God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When the flag is completely folded, which some consider the 13th fold, the stars are uppermost, reminding us of our national motto, in God we trust.
At this time, we would like to perform taps with the bugle. Hi everyone, this is Mr. Hall and I just wanted to say what a great job our veterans did putting on our program this year. This was a much different program as we had to do it virtually, but as you can tell by the theme of sacrifices, it's very appropriate because we've all had to make sacrifices this year. We've had to make sacrifices with uh, wearing masks, with social distancing, with losing some sporting events. Um, there's just been a number of sacrifices with not being able to have this assembly in person this year. But what a great job our veterans and our program did of saying, hey, these veterans put forth these sacrifices every day and look at what they've done to help us remain free and to keep our freedoms, to keep our way of life, and to make sure that we can continue to operate as a free country. So I just wanted to say thank you, what a wonderful job, and to remind everyone that even with all of these sacrifices, we are still a free country and we're able to do all the things thanks to our veterans and people like them.